Hi. So today we're going to be looking at the Tone Projects Hendy Amps Michelangelo plugin. This is one I'm pretty excited about um, because it just sounds fantastic. And for me as a mixing and mastering engineer, it is going to be um, really helpful in, in my work. Um, it's going to get me where I need to go just that much quicker and easier and better. Um, which is always exciting to me, and especially for the kind of music I do, jazz, progressive rock, that kind of thing. Um, I'm looking for something which sounds natural and organic, and that's exactly what this does sound like. It's based on a hardware, a piece of hardware by Hendy Amps, which is a combination EQ saturator where each, it has overall saturation with tube circuits and transformers, but each EQ band also saturates within its own band. And that has been emulated to such a degree that it's closer, according to the Hendy amps themselves, to the unit they modeled than the different uh, versions of that unit are to each other. You know, you make a bunch of Hendy amps, they're always going to be a little bit different. So it's a stupendous feat of uh, modeling uh, right at the very pinnacle of um, hardware modeling. Uh, to my ears, sounds really fantastic. But it's what's so exciting is that it's been taken even beyond that by adding a whole r bunch of digital-only tools, really advanced tools, which are so useful for both mixing and mastering. And even further than that, those amazing tools interact with the emulated tube and transformer circuits. So absolutely amazing piece of software and an amazing achievement. Um, by Tone, Tone Projects and Handy Amps who work together on this. But before we get started, um, if you can like the video and subscribe and ring the bell and press the thanks button, it's really helpful for keeping the channel going and really appreciate it. So before we get started, if you're really just interested in the sound examples, they're later in the video and there's a link below in the description so you can jump straight to that but I'm gonna start with a parameter walkthrough. So, let's have a look. So, here we are with the Tone Projects Handy Amps Michelangelo. Um, this is a hardware unit that has been incredibly accurately reproduced um, to the finest detail, sonic detail. Um, and we're gonna go through the controls and, and see some of the things it can do. Uh, there's a lot here. So if you don't want to know the details, then uh, you can skip forward to the music parts if that's what you're interested in later in the video. But I'm going to give you a pretty good, I'm not going to go to every tiny little nuance because there's a, a lot of detailed controls here, but I'm going to go through most of it to give you an idea of just the depth of this plugin. Uh, I'm going to start with it like this. This is how you get it when it, when it opens up for the first time. Um, and this is the actual hardware. This is what you get with the hardware. Um, but you can open up this and you get a whole bunch of other controls. So they spent a huge amount of time reproducing the hardware uh, in software form. And I have to say, it, it, it's a stupendous piece of work. It's absolutely the very pinnacle, in my view, of achievement of, of software. Um, it really has that analog um, subtlety and nuance. And I think a lot of that uh, without being an expert in this kind of thing in terms of I'm not an electrical engineer and I'm not a software engineer But what I gather from speaking to Rune who's brilliant programmer behind uh, tone projects and and other developers as well is that the really Great pieces of software that are really have gotten to the same level as as hardware um, when emulating or not emulating my understanding of it is that it's not just figuring out a static harmonic set of harmonics if you're talking about saturation but it's having those harmonics vary based on the audio material so depending on transients on frequency content on volume on all those different things um, in a piece of hardware the harmonics that are generated are going to change and you need to model that too. You can't just say, look, here's a static set of harmonics that you know this unit puts out in this particular situation. You're going to have it like that. No, it needs to be way more complicated and it needs to be um, 
like a living, breathing thing like hardware is, which is what we, we like about hardware, um, the same thing can be reproduced in software if you're a good enough um, software engineer. And this is what, I, as my understanding of it, is, is one of the big differences between the software that really goes you know, to the same level as hardware and the, and the, and the ones that, that just kind of mimic it a bit but don't get there. Um, the, so the complexity is huge, and if you open this in Plugin Doctor, you can see that. The complexity is just it, everything you do, everything you do changes the harmonics. Um, and if you change the level of the input, you can see it changing the harmonic pattern. It is very, inter it, it's completely kind of, um, I don't want to use the word organic exactly, but it is in a sense completely uh, changing and moving with everything that goes on uh, input-wise and the controls interacting with each other. And that's the other thing you can see is that these controls like the hardware these curves are not simple curves. They're really complex shapes. I mean, they're su the complexity is subtle. It's not like they're jagging up and down all over the place, but try to reproduce these curves with a static EQ, like a digital EQ, and take a long time. Um, and of course, as you move these, all of that changes anyway, so you're not gonna really be able to duplicate this with a digital EQ. But what takes it much further than that even is that as you move each of these, it changes the others, they all interact. They change, and as you move this one, it's going to change the shape of this one and this one. They all interact with each other. So, um, and that, you know, is based on the Hendy Amps design, which was, you know, vast amounts of time experimenting with, with shapes and curves to get the best sounding curves with different frequencies um, at different settings. Um, so it's a very complex piece of work by Hendy Amps to get the sort of ultimate interactions that you would want sonically and it's been absolutely i think handy amps said something like um this is so close that it's closer to the to the power piece they modeled than than different examples of the handy amps uh, michelangelo are from each other so you know it's it's spot on in other words um which is great but what makes it even more amazing is that you can take it much further than that because each of these EQ bands has a whole section here which isn't in the hardware and couldn't be in the hardware because you couldn't be reproduce these controls in hardware, most of them. So before we get into that, I'm gonna just start going through the controls. So start here with the EQs. These are pretty straightforward. This is a low shelf that has two different shapes and it also shifts these the sort of center part of the shelf down or up, um, but it covers a wide area. You've got a mid-range, which is a bell, which is a very broad bell, which again changes the shape of the bell and the frequency area it centers in on. And then high shelf, and then like a very high shelf, that's very a very steep kind of high shelf um, is what this is. And but But the other difference about this air band is it comes in before the tube drive circuit, unlike the others which are after it. So it reacts really differently. Um, and for that reason, you can really push this way up and it, it, it sounds great. In fact, all of them do. You can push them all the way up, but that's also partly because they interact so much that as you push them up, you're kind of bringing the entire volume up. And that's one of the really key things about this plugin, I think, that brings it into you know, goes beyond the hardware um, and beyond most other plugins is that it has some fantastic auto gain features. So it's got this auto gain here, which is a real time one, um, which is as good as you can get with a real time. A real time auto gains are never going to be that great because they can only react to the instant that you you put it on, the, the instant that it senses a change, it, it tries to compensate. But that's not the same as listening to music over a period of time and getting the loudness value of it. And that's what this match control down here does. If you click on this, it sits there and it blinks for a while and it listens to the music and it gets the loudness and it, then it matches the volume with that. And it, this is incredibly accurate, I have to say, sounding. It's the most accurate one I've ever come across. But you can use them both at the same time. So you can kind of use this as a kind of quick and dirty gain match thing and, and then you know, periodically click on this one and wait two or three seconds while it 
listens and, and really matches it really accurately. So I think that's essential on any plugin, I think, where the volume changes, like, like especially broad EQ type plugins or saturation plugins, but particularly on this one, because as you turn these up, you are moving the entire level of the signal up because they overlap. So that's why it's so important to have this gain match is that your ears can be so easily fooled um, when you are working with a, uh, any plugin that does these kind of things, but in particular something like this. So, you know, great on them for doing that because a lot of plugin manufacturers don't bother with that. And they're very happy for your fooled ears to get fooled by loudness increases. Um, but they, yeah, they find, you know, well, good on them basically for putting that in and two versions of it. Um, now here you've got um, aggression it's called and it's, it drives the tube circuit and there's tubes and transformers that are all interacting and it just drives the circuit but it doesn't just add gain to it. Um, if you want to do that you can use this headroom here it's kind of like a headroom control, and this this kind of um, gives you, it, it. This drives the circuit while keeping the actual um, sound of it the same, which is super useful. So if you if you turn up this, which um, changes the quality of the saturation significantly, as well as driving more into it, it really changes the tonal quality. And each of these drives the saturation within its own frequency band and they interact with this significantly. So the tonal variation you have in here is, is huge. So if you've got something here where you think, wow, I've just got this fantastic tone going here. Um, and if it's, you know, you can, the other thing is that this trim, as you turn this down, it turns the level down, but it also changes the, this is within the tube transformer circuit, so it changes the tone as well. So if you turn this down and you need to turn it up, you've got a clean output here and a clean input here. So this is part of your tone circuit as well. Um, so you, you, know, you play around with this until you get something that sounds really great, but you think, well, I just wish there was a bit more drive in here. You don't want to move this because it's going to change the tone, so you can move this to drive it more. If you think, well, I, I love it, but I want to clean it up a bit. You can just clean it up without changing the tone that you've got with all these, these controls here. So fantastically thought through. Um, uh, now, moving down here, tubes naturally compress, and this gives you the ability to go further. So this is in the center of the way the hardware would work, but you can clean it up, not clean it up, but you can make the tubes compress less than they naturally would. And here you can, um, you can make them compress more than they naturally would. So it's a special kind of compression that you get from tubes that affects transients, so really, can be part of their whole tonal palette. Really useful extra tonal palette to have here. Um, some neat things I have built in is you can click on these and it disables them. But although it disables the band, it doesn't disable the interactions that you that this has had with the other bands by moving it to this position. So that's a really clever. Um, any of these controls can be put back to its default value by option or alt clicking on it. Um, now, here you have a tube blend. This is a major uh, tonal shaper. The triode place here, if you have it moved over to the left, at 100% triode, this is the, the hardware, the Michelangelo Handy Amps hardware has a triode tube, so um, this is exactly like the hardware. It doesn't have pento tubes in it, but they've modeled pento tubes so you can move it over here and get a completely different sounding saturation that isn't possible in the hardware but nonetheless sounds great it's much more kind of emphasis in the highs and and, and upper mids and and you get more uh, more punch here you get more richness and you know warm richness and you can go anywhere in between the two so again you've got a huge palette of tonal colors here and just before we get onto this section, I'm going to cover here. You've got spread and crosstalk. Now these are very uh, valuable controls and um, kind of unique. I mean, there are there are other plugins that have things like this, but this is unique because it's 
crosstalk can spread within the actual Michelangelo hardware. So the hardware units have a certain amount of crosstalk in them, which means, you know, one left and right are, are kind of crossing into each other a bit and affecting each other. And that's part of its sound, part of it, that, that affects your um, sound stage, your stereo image and your front to back depth. And a lot of hardware has, you know, people say, oh, it's got this extra kind of 3D depth to it. And that comes from, um, partly from crosstalk. And here, this is at zero, this is the crosstalk that the Michelangelo hardware unit that they modeled has naturally in it, but you can increase that. And the interesting thing is, or reduce it, the interesting thing is that Handy Amps um, manufactured variations of the unit per customer request. If, if, for example, a mastering engineer wanted a bit more crosstalk, they made some of the units have more or less. And here you can just vary it at will, which is just amazing. Spread here, this is the difference between left and right channels um, caused by natural tolerances and this can be increased or reduced. And if you decided to increase it and you're getting a little bit too much of certain frequency on one side, you can swap over the cross top, the uh, spread rather, um, to make it sound more even. So it's just amazing. And I find these things, uh, as I'll show later on and demonstrate this, are uh, one of the most powerful um, elements of this plugin and not something I've, I've despite these similar controls being in rubber units, I have never heard anything that sounds this um, great on how it affects the sound stage in a positive way. Okay, um, so I'm gonna leave this section till last and I'm gonna jump over and, and, and just finish off this bit here. High and low pass filters, um, you've got a range of different things, a, sh a soft shelf that you can use to bring down the highs and you've got six, 12 and 18 dB uh, high sorry, low pass, or, um, and then you've got high pass here and a similar thing, you've got a, a soft shelf and you've got 6, 12, 18, but the 18 has a bump on it, which is really useful for getting tightening of that low end. And up here, I'm not gonna go over this, it's pretty straightforward. Um, you can scale the EQ, which is super useful, and you can change the aliasing, aliasing rather, um, here, I have to say the default is high and I could not see any aliasing, even at really extreme drive settings at the high setting. So amazing. And, but if you want to go even higher, so there's just like no chance of any aliasing, you can go up to pristine. And I find that it, it doesn't kill your CPU, at least on my M1 Mac, it, it seems absolutely fine with it. Um, but you've got the option to go down if you need to, and then you can render it at a higher level. Right, now for this section here. Each of these bands, and by the way, there's two extra bands here that aren't available on the hardware, which are um, two more EQ bands, which also interact with the circuitry like these do. So they're not clean EQ bands, they, they boost saturation or cut within their own, the range you set them at. But it gives you some uh, more surgical tools if you need them and a range. So it, at any frequency, like you can have a wide bell, narrow bell, high or low shelf, which is super useful if you need to do like a, a narrow band cut or something and you've got frequency range here. All of these adjustable frequency ranges, oh, I haven't covered that yet, but I will. Um, they, they overlap and, and they're very variable. So there's a huge range here. Now I'm not gonna cover any more here because the rest of this is, is the same here. So each of these has the same controls below it, and it basically turns this into a dynamic EQ and, f and uh, transient shaper um, plus mid side. So it's taking this hardware way beyond what it'd be possible to do with hardware, uh, certainly as you, if you take this as a whole. Uh, even if you might be able to do some of this, um, doing it per band and doing all of this in, for each band we would never be possible in the hardware, my understanding is that you couldn't get even close to it in the hardware world. So, you can select the frequency freely here, which you can't do on the hardware, but really useful. Um, if you option click, it takes you to the default frequency from the hardware. You can drive this band, per band drive which is amazing. So if you really just want to saturate that low end or high end, you can do that without affecting the rest. In fact, you can pull the saturation down on each of the bands, which is fantastic. 
turns this into a real, a really highly um, usable and, and highly um, useful mastering tool. This is the kind of thing mastering engineers die for, is this level of detail. But on mixes, it could be equally useful um, if you and kind of know how to work these sort of things on a per band basis. They, you can use them to really shape tone in, in some incredibly useful ways if you're somebody that likes to dive into the details and, and, and get into all that stuff. It, it is super powerful, but it's not everybody's cup of tea to kind of get into all that detail, but it's all here. And from my perspective, this brings this like so far above anything else. It's, you know, the only other place I've seen this level of control on say mid-side intransigence is the um, eventide split EQ, but that doesn't have it driving in and interacting with a tube and transformer circuit, and each of these does that for each of these controls. It's a whole different level of, uh, of um, possibilities here that not been available before. And this is really comprehensive too, so let's have a look. You've got the drive, you've got the frequency, you've got mid-side, not just mid side, but anywhere in between the mid and the side, so you can blend somewhere in between. Um, oh, one quick thing is you hold down shift, you can move all of these together, so that's quite useful. Um, so mid and side, and then you've got transient body, so you've got transient shaping. If you move it all the way over to here, as I'll demonstrate all of this when we get to the sound examples, um, this EQ is going to be boosting the transients, but not the body sustain part of the, so if you were you know, honing in on trying to get more, more, more punch into your kick drum, you can move this over to the transient and boost the punch without blowing up the whole low end with a lot of boost, if you see what I mean. On the other hand, if you don't want to boost those transients so much because they're already as punchy as you want them, but you want a bit more weight and a bit more solidity and a bit more body, you can move it over to the, to the body part. On the other hand, if you wanted to make the high end, the cymbals, for example, really silky and smooth by boosting the high end, but you didn't want to increase the kind of attack of the cymbals, which might start getting a bit too hard edged, um, you could move it over towards the body um, and you'd get that. Um, you could even compress alongside with that. And this is the next area here, is if you've got a compressor on each of these um, EQ bands, which means we've got a dynamic EQ, but it's not just a dynamic EQ, it's a really versatile one. And this, again, it takes it above and beyond um, any other plugin I know in terms of this being able to interact with um, all of these, you know, circuits in here. Um, so you've got here a very comprehensive um, compressor for this band and they're all separate, obviously. Threshold control here, range. Now, if you push this up, the higher up you push it, the more it's gonna expand. So anything that crosses a threshold is gonna get louder. And what actually that means that this EQ is gonna boost further than wherever you've set it as it crosses a threshold by this amount. And you can see it with a blue line that moves up beyond where you've set the EQ knob as it crosses the threshold. Or you can move it the other way and you can compress. So every time it crosses the threshold, it pulls back on that EQ. Or if that's not enough, you can click this here and it changes it so that whatever happens happens if it falls below the threshold. So anything below the threshold will be brought even further down. Or if it's above the threshold, below the threshold, it's going to then get brought further up. So you've basically, here you've, you've got um, upward compression, downward compression, upward expansion, and downward expansion. All four of those possible uh, dynamics processing right here in this one control and all within this EQ band. And each band has its own, as well as these extra bands, all have those controls. But there's more. If you click here, you can control details about the transient shaping. So the duration of the transient. So if you want really, really snappy ones, you can bring the transient duration down. 
Uh, if you want a longer transient to be boosted, you can bring up the duration. And also, you can shape the amount of the, you know, where the sustain part, uh, the body part begins and ends if you're using the body. It's really great having this control for per band. Um, and even the Eventide split EQ doesn't have this per band. It has it, one of these for the entire, uh, for all bands at once. Then you have sensitivity. So this is how sensitive it is to the transients. And you can change that. And then down here you have the compressor. You've got attack, full control of the attack and full control of the release, which is absolutely amazing. You can really shape the punch and the sustain or whatever it is you need to do with that, that area or the density, whatever you need to work with. So yeah, I think that covers everything. Um, so as you can see, this is just a whole other level when you put all of this together. Um, absolutely, you know, up there with the very best that there is, in my view, plus all this really advanced digital um, tools built into it and, and working within these circuits is just, it's, it's amazing. So, Let's now have a listen to what this thing can do. Uh, so I've started with a, got a default setting here. I've made it nice and big. The default size is smaller than this, but you can expand it and I, I've made it bigger so it's easy to see on the video. Um, okay, so here we go. I'm gonna start with it out and then bring it in without any EQ and then I'm gonna start working with the low end. Starting with it out. So you can hear some thickness and density coming into the sound from the saturation. So now I'm going to start working with the low end. Um, I'm going to boost the low end and change the control for, for um, it, the, the shape of the curve here. Um, it's set at 85 hertz. Actually, I'm going to bring it uh, back to, I think the default is, is lower down. I'm going to bring it down into the 50, 60 range anyway. And then I'm going to be working with the transient. So you can hear the difference between a sharp transient uh, boost and, you, and, a, and a, a wider, taking more of the body. Um, and then I'm also going to work with the compressor uh, expander to, to really bring out the punch so you can hear what that can do. So you can really hear how when I move it over to the transient side, you get serious punch coming out of that low end. Um, it's, I have to say, it, it's, this is one of the most impressive sounding low end uh, plugins I've heard because it's so rich and dense and, and weighty um, and, and sort of rich sounding, but at the same time, really punchy. And uh, those two things together are usually things that you don't get at the same time. 
so uh, in the low end. So um, yeah, that's amazing uh, that you can get both those things. Um, now I'm going to just finish off on this frequency band by working with um, the compressor here, and I'm going to get even more punchy by expanding uh, with the range control. And I'm uh, yeah. You can hear as I change the release here, um, it really changes what the expander is doing because um, when you have a shorter release time, it's, it's pushing up a, a shorter amount of this EQ here. Um, so you're getting a really tight punch and then as I move the release time up, you're getting more of that kick drum, more of the sustain is being boosted as part of the punch and so you get a really thick, weighty sound so you've got a lot of variation here on the type of punch that you want and the type of of uh, weight and solidity that you want so i'm just going to finish off by going even further uh, again i'm overdoing everything here massively just so you can hear what it can do I, I wouldn't take it anywhere near this far in a real mix but well i might do but in most cases probably not so i'm just going to finish off by going a bit further with the transient just so you can hear the two working together <laughs> So there you go, um, a, hopefully a, a useful range of different um, things that you can do with the low end. As you can hear, it's super versatile. I have done a bit of a cut here around the 300 just to pull out a bit of mud, just so you can hear that low end nice and defined there. Okay, so since I've done a cut there, um, I'm going to move this mid-range up um, into the more kind of melody area of sort of, you know, 800 hertz to 1k, that sort of area. It's a very wide bell on the mid uh, EQ here, so it's gonna, if I put it at 800, it's gonna, or even 1k, it's gonna grab a huge area going down way below and way above that, but it's gonna center in around that area. So have a listen to the bass, especially the high notes on the bass, and, and hear what this um, can do. I'm gonna pull this down to slightly more reasonable levels here. Um, as I drive the saturation, um, it really brings out the richness of those tones. So, so have a listen to that and also mess with some of these other controls.
you can hear what's happening when I've, I'm compressing it, because you can see it's pulling the gain down here, but I'm also really boosting it. What's actually happening is, when well, you see the blue line here, that's how much is actually being boosted because it's being compressed. Um, at the same time as being boosted. Um, so it's not boosting that much, it's boosting as much as you see the blue line here, which means you get a compressed signal being raised in level, which means you get a very, uh, a lot more density in that area. So you're really compressing, densing, gluing that mid-range uh, area together while bringing it more forward. Again, which is something you'd struggle to do with um, any other single tool I can think of. Um, yes, you can do that with a, two or three plugins in, in together, but you're not gonna get the kind of interaction that you're getting here where each of these interacts with the two transformer circuits, um, plus the variation obviously you can get. So uh, I'm gonna just keep going a little bit on this mid and then we'll move over to the high. Now we've got like a really rich, thick, rich thing happening in the mid-range because uh, driving quite hard. I've moved it over to the to the truck to the pentobe, which uh, is changing the tonal quality of it. So, I mean, you, there's a lot more you can do with these controls. As I said, this changes the quality of the saturation a lot as you move it, and then you've got you know the ability to drive it less. It's almost like a headroom control. This um, and then you've got this whole variation here. So there's just so much you can work with here in terms of different kinds of tones. Uh, okay, moving over to the highs. I'm gonna pull this back to a more reasonable level again. Um, and I'm gonna move over to this area and I'm gonna move this up a bit higher, I think, into the kind of upper mid-range area and see what we get with this.
So you can hear there's a lot of variation there as well. And another thing you've noticed is how far I can push this. Um, because these shapes of these curves are so uh, broad and that they interact with each other, um, you can push it way up there and it's not the same as pushing a, a normal digital EQ. Um, it doesn't sound like you've massively boosted um, the EQ, which is why they don't have DB markings here, because it isn't like that. The whole shape changes. It's also why you really need this uh, output compensation, because otherwise you're really just, as well as EQing it, you're turning the volume up. But you're also changing the nature of the, an amount of saturation as you do this, as much as EQing it. Okay, so now we're going to have a go with air and see what we get with that. So you can hear how that nicely opens out and opens up the top end and brings kind of a spaciousness and air to the sound. And just a quick note here, you notice when I change this, it's the same with all of these bands. It shifts not just the shape, but the frequency area that it centers in on, that the curve centers in on. And that means that, because on the hardware you can't shift the frequency, these are set frequencies, but it means that when I shift this, he also shifts what's available here. So. Over here, you can see this was up around, I think I had it up around sort of 8K-ish or something. When I flick over to here, this jumps down to 6K because the whole curve shifts downwards. So if I still want a higher air kind of thing, I'm gonna to need to move this up. Um, so just that you understand um, how that works. And it's the same with all these different bands. So I'm gonna show you another instance. Um, of the plugin, I bypassed the other one, just to show you some of the other kinds of things you can do with this. Now, the boost end, the low end's boosted quite a bit, and it's and it's got some punch added to it, so you'll notice that. But I want you to also just have a listen to what happens to the sound stage, because on this one I've boosted up the spread and the crosstalk, and I got quite a bit of mid side information going up in the on the upper frequencies. So listen to how when I engage it, I'll start with it out again, it just opens out the sound stage. If you have headphones on, you're not gonna hear this, but if you've got a good pair of speakers, you'll hear it open out right behind the speakers, like you can see the distance between the instruments at the front and, and the back of the room, as it were. Um, so the whole sound stage widens and it deepens. Uh, so have a listen to this. You hear how the entire soundstage just like triples in size? It's quite remarkable, absolutely quite remarkable. These are the kind of subtle things that mastering engineers are always trying to get from analog gear. Um, and in the digital world, there are ways of getting this too, but it's, you know, a little 
complicated and it's very easy to slip into things sounding a bit artificial. Um, and what's great about some analog pieces, hardware, is that they just kind of give you this 3D effect through things like crosstalk and spread that are going on because of the way the hardware is designed, um, you know, and tolerances and all of that kind of stuff and interactions between the components, you get these shifts going on. And there is some software that works in this way too. Um, but this, I think, takes it really to another level. Um, I mean, I've got various pieces of software that I use that give me these kinds of effects, or sometimes I use combinations of things. Um, but this one just instantly, it's there and it's very natural sounding. It doesn't sound like you've put any kind of effect on it, even at fairly extreme settings like this. But it absolutely opens up the sound stage. Um, so yeah, it, it's just fantastic. Um, I cannot uh, praise this enough. Um, it's impossible to make it sound bad. Um, but there are so many great sounds within it that you can pull out of pretty much any mix. Uh, so, yeah, super recommended. And I, I have to say um, to Rune and Tone Projects and, and Handy Amps, um, just like huge congratulations for it. It's a tremendous achievement, uh, in my view, to have created something on this level. It really is at the very pinnacle of um, what's... Uh, sonically possible, either in hardware or software. Um, so yeah, fantastic work, and um, I hope you found this useful. Um, if you did, please do give the video a like and ring the bell, subscribe, and if you could press the thanks button, that's really helpful for keeping the channel going and really appreciated, and hope to see you next time.